Bramborough back with Ultimate Admiral Dreadnoughts in our legendary France 1890 campaign. Once every generation or so, a military technology introduces a revolutionary rather than an incremental improvement. The jet aircraft, the turreted tank, the guided missile. All else before it instantly becomes obsolete. The navies of Europe are about to be rudely introduced to just such a thing. And they'll see their precious battleship lines overnight become floating scrap metal for all that they're worth. The instrument of their doom will be delivered at the hands of the Admiralty of France. Let's hop in. At the end of the last episode, embarked on a bit of a shipbuilding program, and at that point, we were about negative three and a half million or so in the hole for a monthly balance. Following a comment by someone, uh, a couple, you know, a comment exchange, I am going to try for the first time using this uh, limited <laughs> uh, stance in peacetime, only in peacetime. I had shied away from using this because I thought, well, it's got to be less readiness than in being. Therefore, I would assume the only way they could do that is if the crew uh, proficiency starts to drop. Uh, I am told that no, it is not. So I'm going to give it a try. And I've got the entire fleet, the entire fleet limited whole thing. However, I am noting, okay, Normandy, as of March 1897, is veteran. I'll, I'll, I'll be checking in a few months and see if she's still veteran. <laughs> Brennus is trained. Valarus is trained. Bayern. Bairn. I don't know how to say these French names. I think I get some of them pretty close. I think I completely butcher others. Uh, Bairn is veteran. So we'll see how it works out. Okay, well, it's September 97, and so we've advanced six months, and sure enough, Normandy is still a veteran, as is Bairn, and I haven't seen any others that lost any, so yeah, I'm sold. Limited. That's the way to go for saving money in peacetime. I, I would assume that in wartime, limited means very little power projection, maybe not even get pulled into battles or if it does it's like crappy odds something like that but uh peacetime sure just when you go to war don't forget <laughs> <clears throat> and i put two battleships in uh the other states just to show the relationship so see there brennis is in the middle stance in being at six hundred thousand per month normandy at limited is half that, 300,000 a month, and Valarus Sea Control, 900,000, you know, roughly, round number, per month. And then I do still have uh, a couple of the same class. These are also Normandy class who are mothballed, and they are at 90,000 per month. Of course, there's no crew on them. So those are the four uh, states as far as ship maintenance goes. Right, so in the last episode we did uh, some battleship designs and a new heavy cruiser, which was actually fairly similar to the original heavy cruiser, uh, but a little bit bigger. We've also had a new torpedo boat design in this campaign. What we have not had thus far is uh, another light cruiser design and with the budget that was freed up by putting the whole fleet in limited and then with all the various tech advances uh, had the ability now to go for a 3500 ton light cruiser compared to the 3000 ton 
to which the Lenoir slash Nieli class uh, was limited. It's still the same hull. This is an incremental improvement, much like our heavy cruiser design was in the last episode. But was able to do a couple things here. Um, you know, this thing has some tech in it, which the older cruiser does not have. Uh, she's got a little bit more efficient engine. We're still in triple expansion, right? We're still in coal and all that sort of thing. But she does have aux engines. I don't think the Nieli class has that. Uh, she's got a little bit better armor quality. A little bit better anti... Well, I don't think the first one has any anti-flood at all. So we've got anti-flood. We have reinforced bulkheads. We have a citadel. Or at any, at any rate, a better citadel than the earlier cruiser. <clears throat> so she's just a little bit better of a ship, even if her primary characteristics are not a huge improvement. Still a 21 knot ship. It turns out, uh, you know, until we get some better propulsion tech, it can't go too much above 21 knots with this hull at this tonnage in this era. <laughs> so she's still 21 knot. She does have more range. The biggest difference is this ship has got a main armament of 5.9 inch guns instead of Miele's 4.9s. She does have fewer of them. The Miele class has six 4.9s. This class, which is going to be the Lamont Piquet, uh, only has four 5.9s. But, this is a big but, she delivers the same firepower. Because, on the earlier design, we had those those uh, main guns in these deck edge uh, gun tubs right here mounted here so at, at any given target porter starboard Miele can still only fire four guns 4.9s here I've placed two of her main guns center line with pretty darn good port and starboard arcs of fire. So Lamont Piquet can still shoot four guns at any one target, just like Miele. And these are 5.9s. Her little casemates are still 3.9s, just like on the earlier class. And what else did I do? The same uh, four torpedo tubes. Uh, I think these are a little bit bigger. I've got 17 inch available. That was just too snarky or too fiddly to work in. So she's got 16 inch. She's also got pretty darn low flash fire chance. So I went ahead and I'm rolling the dice with uh, ballistite propellant and gun cotton bursting charge. And it turns out I don't have the black and brown powder available anymore anyway. They're obsolete, so with the low flash fire chance, I'm going with the ballistite and the gun god. And of course she has the coincidence rangefinder, which the older class has been refit to as well. Armor scheme is a roughly pretty much the same, except she's got a little bit more Citadel stuff interior. Uh, but she's got a little bit higher armor quality having the um, nickel steel instead of the compound. And so she's a little bit more expensive. However, she's also a little heavier anyway. So on a cost per ton basis, she's pretty much coming in at the same uh, ballpark in cost. And also worth mentioning, um, bringing in these main guns to a more efficient layout like this uh, also helped a little bit with uh, pitch and roll. It's still the coal era, so there's still a buttload of smoke interference and crap engine efficiency. But I've talked about that before. Anyway, there she is, the Lamont Piquet class.
Right, technology is allowing us to build a substantially higher tonnage torpedo boat now. And it's still kind of an incremental improvement because it's not a new haul. Uh, the, the tech actually takes us up to 700 ton, but I guess with the shipyard size we have and this particular hull, we're limited to 500 tons, which is 200 tons uh, larger than the Frond class, uh, which is our latest design in the fleet. Okay, so what is this going to give us that in addition to Frond? Well, she's a little more stable. Her pitch and roll numbers are still garbage but they're better than the earlier TVs and the tonnage is such that I was able to drop the uh, the small two inch guns here in these little wing positions which weren't very good anyway <clears throat> as far as firing arc and she's and this class has more room for 3.9 inch guns aft so whereas the Fron gave us three 3.9s this uh, this is going to be the peak Class, I think that is pronounced. Uh, it gives us four 3.9s. Other than that, she's more or less similar. Same top speed, 31.9 remains the break point at which the, the tonnage goes out of whack. And she's got slightly better uh, characteristics than some of these. Uh, I, I'm still only going with the one torpedo, you know, because you know, it's a gunnery focused uh, design, which is a little odd for a torpedo boat, I know. But the torpedo she does carry uh, is a 17 incher, and we've had a little bit of tech advancement in that realm as well. Uh, our torpedoes go out to 1.5 kilometers now. So the range on the torps is starting to increase a little bit. Now there's a completely different way to do this. You can just put the tiniest gun you possibly can in the one required spot, free up as much deck space back here as you can, and you can fit a ridiculous number of torpedo tubes back here as well. And just build swarms and swarms and swarms of these things. And each individual torpedo boat, you know, gets up close to a capital ship and gets murdered, but there's so many of them. And once they do get within range, you know, they pop off four torpedoes. <laughs> that That's the other way to play torpedo boats uh, in the 1890s. And it, it works pretty darn well. I'm just not going that route here. Anyway, um, because both the Frond class, which there are quite a f there are some in the fleet already, and the Peak class, because they are significantly faster... I mean, it's still terrible engine efficiency with the tech that we have for now. Um, but because they are significantly faster, I think I'm going to go ahead and build a whole bunch of these and then retire the uh, original Carquois slash Saber class. I think that'll work out. Peak class torpedo boat. There you go. Save. After quite a few years of peace, war has erupted again in Europe. France is not involved yet, but I don't think it's going to take very long. The second uh, Anglo-German war has broken out. No combat has occurred yet, but that will come, I'm sure, next month. It's uh, Britain versus Germany and Austria. I think technically it's the British-Austrian War, however, or the Anglo-Austrian War. But we know how this is going to turn out. Austria is going to sit down here and just kind of watch, <laughs> read the newspapers, to find out uh, how their buddies are doing up here in the North Sea. <clears throat> That's what I expect anyway. As I said, uh, France has not pulled in yet. However, the round of relations changes from the war declarations dropped us immediately to minus, minus 90 with Britain. 
And it also boosted us with everybody else, so we're not going to fight anybody else. We're at 90, for crying out loud, with Italy, which is the country I'd most like to fight. <laughs> In any case, I think uh, war will, with uh, Britain will be coming soon. And how do we stand headed toward that in the next, I don't know, a couple months. So the overall size and force structure of the French fleet is pretty similar to what it has been. It has expanded a little bit. Instead of the uh, five battleship groups that I had established after the end of the last war, <clears throat> now up to six. Uh, there's one such group in every one of the six major home ports. So three groups uh, up here in La Havre, Brest, and La Rochelle, and then one each in Marseille, Toulon, and Nice. All of our ships, e even though that the overall, you know, roughly similar numbers of BBs, heavies, lights, and torpedo boats, they're all better than the <clears throat> Not all, but most of them are better than the ships with which we fought the the uh, the last Anglo-French War. All of the torpedo boats have now been replaced and, and are the uh, 30, 30 plus knot uh, newer torpedo boat designs. The vast majority of them are the newest uh, peak class. And uh, there's still a few fronds, but all the Carquois Sabre class are scrapped. Uh, I think about half of our light cruisers are the newer Lamont Piquet class. There's still quite a few of the older uh, Lenoir class still around. Probably about 60 to 70 out of these 24 heavy cruisers, I think probably 16 of them are the newer Cayman class, which have a little bit better armor than uh, the old Toulon class. And a little bit more firepower too. I think they have an extra turret. And then among our battleships, we have uh, the two Duquesne class from the beginning of the last episode. They've been in commission for a while. They're at La Rochelle. The first two of the much larger Courant class uh, have commissioned. And another pair of the big uh, Courant class uh, is just a month away from completion. So we have 12 battleships active right at this moment. Next month there will be 14, and then there's also two battleships that I had mothballed in La Rochelle. With war imminent, I'm going to pull those ships out of mothball. Matter of fact, I'm going to do it right now before I forget. <laughs> Where are those guys? Here they are. Democrity and uh, Revanche. Okay. Now they're coming out of mothballs and they've been in that state for several years. So they are. No. Okay. I, I thought that they would come back as cadet, but they, they're trained. And that could possibly be because with all of the uh, new ships coming online, but also scrapping some of the older ships. Um, and then with, and one thing I, I've never, I've never let off of the crew training. So I guess just the, yeah, okay. That's why the average training level of our crew pool is trained. So. There you go, 14 battleships, 16 battleships in the next, uh, next month.
which just means that these two battleship groups here are going to be centered on four battleships apiece instead of two. And even with the newer designs, the, uh, the Duquesne and the Coron, uh, I did not increase their speed. And so speed-wise, uh, the older and the newer battleships should interoperate just fine. And that's the way it stands. Still at peace, but I don't think that's going to stay that way for long. And the other thing that I will mention is I don't know if Britain's going to make it out of this war. Potentially wars. Uh, still a nation. They're going into this with public opinion already at unrest and a naval prestige of minus 74. So Britain may dissolve before this round of hostilities ends. In addition, they got, they got no crew pool. Right? They came out of that last war, they lost a bunch of ships, they've rebuilt a bunch of ships, but their crew pool, they've had a crew pool situ, uh, situation for the last several years. So it it is not at all clear that all of these ships are fully manned or even manned at all. Germany is also low on crew pool. However, she had a pretty robust crew pool coming out of the last war, which Germany won. But Germany has gotten up to 200 ships. Either way, if they start loot not if, when they start losing ships and building more, they're going to have a hard time crewing any new construction. The Anglo-German Wars proceeded for several months now. We're into October 1899. Lots of fighting going on in the North Sea. Lots of clashes. Both navies the, the German and the British ones <laughs> doing a ton of ship repairs and having crew pool problems and that sort of thing. Britain is kind of going out of its way not to further deteriorate relations with us. So we may not be as close to war as I thought we would be. There have been other developments, however. Our tech advantage is this technology gap is starting to pay off. Just picked up a new tech, longitudinal strength and hull girders. That doesn't sound that great. But it unlocks a new hull, the experimental battleship. Let's check this thing out and see what kind of shenanigans we can do with it. Take a look at that. This is not a dreadnought hull. Not yet. But we are getting close. I don't think she's going to have the speed of a dreadnought yet. She's not going to have quite the uh, armor arrangements and the armament arrangements but this is a lot closer to a dreadnought than it is to a pre-dreadnought. This is the transition in progress right here. And we are going, definitely going to design and build and field some of these. Don't think the, the propulsion techs and the fuels and everything are quite up to, uh, you know, breaking the 20 knot barrier. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and keep it at 18. I'm sure this hull can probably go faster than that. However, we're still stuck with coal. We're still stuck with crappy funnels. Even if I made it faster, that would eat more weight and... She's probably, we're probably still going to struggle to propel her at much faster than 18 knots. 
and still had and while still putting up with terrible smoke interference. So 18 knots. Um, I'm gonna make her a little beamy. Let's just take the beam up to about as much as we can within our shipyard size. Okay, so about 7.6. 7.5 okay yeah right at 7.5 extra beam and that extra beam will add a little bit of stability I'm not going to lower her draft though okay let's go with the standard crew Still stuck with coal, natural boilers. We'll go with the uh, triple expansion. Let's give her the bells and whistles. I mean, this is going to be the preeminent capital ship in all of Europe. Let's not skimp. We're also up to just past nickel steel armor, and now we have Harvey armor available. Remember the anti remember the ranges on torpedoes are starting to come up we cannot uh, and pretty soon someone's going to unlock that uh, you know, probably us but pretty soon the the large torpedo boat boat hulls are going to be uh, unlocked and come into play and, and those are essentially proto destroyers so yeah not to mention, uh, some point fairly soon, deck-mounted torpedo launchers are going to become a thing on, like, cruisers. Yeah, anti-torp. Uh, double hull. Reinforced. Anti-flooding. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. We have 60% armor quality now. Um... We could probably get away with just the 12. Let's go 12.5 though. Save a little bit of weight on the fore and aft belt. And stay with 2.5 main deck. 1.5 fore and aft decks. Let's just go 14 on the conning tower. I like to have armor on the superstructure. So 1.5 first inner belt and uh, 0 0.5 on the second inner belt. Let's go 0 0.5 on the inner deck. Okay. Best tower we can get is this guy. Now notice where these these are main armament gun mount spots these circular spots on the deck and that's part of we're not so I'm going to line it up right here with this forward one right here and that's part of we're not quite at dreadnought yet there's no barbettes there's no center line super firing um, and, I, and I'm still limited on how many center line main gun turrets there are so we're going to have to use these things that's not quite lined up right now well, it looks a little off either way we'll go with that secondary tower Tempting to put it back here. I'm going to want to shorten the citadel a little bit though. So I think I'm going to want. You know, the idea is that the aft turret would go here down in this lower deck, but I, I think I'm going to want to perch it up here to shorten the citadel length. So I'm not real sure where this. Let's put it there for now. I don't know. I 
I'd like to only do whatever is minimum necessary to get about 50 engine efficiency. Okay, I don't want to do more than that if I don't have to. What's our smoke? 39. Starting that, that's actually not terrible. I just don't know if I can put main gun turrets here. There are a few barbettes supposedly available, but I, I can't put them anywhere. Well, I can here. I don't think I can perch a main gun on top of that, though. Now, for main guns, I sure would like to put the 12.9s on. Those are still Mark 1s, and I've got Mark 2 11s. So kind of like what I talked about with the Corone class last episode, I'm going to stick with the 11.9s for now. Yeah, let's get it up here. I don't want it back here. It's a long citadel. And the fire, even as far aft as I can get it here. That firing arc isn't that great. Yeah, let's perch it right about there. And now we can move this half tower back a little bit. It's still a great firing arc. It's going to get cut out in a minute anyway. Side guns. Same deal. 11.9s. Yeah. So every other battleship up till now has had two main turrets. Now we got six, four of which can fire port and starboard in a broadside. Eight guns in a broadside instead of four or two in the case of the earlier single turrets. I am 100% sure that there will not be another battleship in Europe for at least the next five years that will have any hope of standing up to this. Okay, well, and the pitch and roll is not bad, even with those uh, deck edge mounted uh, main turrets. Geez, looking pretty good. All right, more bells and whistles. I like the bells and whistles. Already did these. Um, let's try Barbette 2. May have to dial that back. Standard ratio. Yeah, we'll stay with max HE for the secondaries. Nose fuse is fine. Let's go with the capped. Capped AP, heavy shells. This thing is going to be putting out such a volume per broadside. Do I need standard? Man, I just hate running out of ammo. <laughs> Let's take the plunge on Ballistite. Oh, I don't think I want to go Picric Acid. I'm going to stay with Black Powder. Not going to go electrical. <clears throat> Ooh, 
we're getting close. I haven't even put secondaries on. Some some of this is going to have to get dialed back. We also also we also have the first generation stereoscopic rangefinder instead of coincidence. Which gives us long range accuracy vice base accuracy. It also improves aiming speed, but not quite as much as the coincidence does. I feel like coincidence remains the better choice for now. I'm not sold on that. I'm about 50-50 on that choice. Okay. Uh, Yeah, some of this is going to have to come down and wait because I like putting a lot of the I like putting a lot of secondaries on as well, which really means casemates. There's really not too much, uh, you know. There's so there's so many main guns on the main deck level that putting any secondary mounts. It's just going to interfere with the firing arcs of the main guns. So I want to keep the deck clear. We could put a few secondary guns on this little aft deck down here. I sure wouldn't want to be assigned to those gun crews for the secondary guns down here. Not with this turret right on top of me. But we'll just leave it. If I put any back there, it'll be for weight distribution reasons rather than firepower. So casemate guns. I like the 3.9s. They've been working pretty well. And there's a bunch of mounts. Now the firing arcs aren't great on these casemates, but they're spaced very closely together. When anything, anything does come close to the broadside, it's going to catch a whole bunch. back here too. Man, that is such overkill. <laughs> how many how many is that? 40. That is 43 point yeah just stick that one on there too. <laughs> 42 Yeah I like it. I like it. I gotta say, I'm really enjoying these French holes. However, at, at now we're at 1,500 tons. I gotta find somewhere, and we got a shitload of aft weight offset. <laughs> okay, I think I can live without the enhanced reloading. And that bought about 400 tons. That's a good start. What is our flash fire chance? It's not great. It's not super terrible. How do I feel about dialing down to barbette one? First, how much weight does that buy? A little over a hundred tons. Uh, I think I'd rather find the weight somewhere else. I'm willing to drop too many bulkheads. 
I dropped quite a bit. That helped a lot. Don't want to give up crew quarters. It's the same thing here. It's either anti-flood three or nothing. I can't do an anti-flood two or one. I don't know why that is. I thought it was because of... Is that because of tech? Or is it hull specific? It used to be, you know, you, you would unlock them one at a time and then you could take your choice of each. And it doesn't seem to be that way in this campaign. So I think maybe that was a recent update, I suppose. Like even now, on this hull as well. I can only do Citadel 3, but not Citadel 1 or 2. I mean, I'm willing to shave a little bit of armor here and there, but I don't think I'm going to shave 600 tons worth here. The turrets are maximum armored. Let's go 13.5. I, I can already tell from the weight offset. I, I, I can't have these back here. <laughs> So that saved a little bit of weight as well. Nope, there's not. Shave a little casemate armor there. Actually, I'm willing to go down to four for that. Okay. Uh, having turret top armor that's less than the main deck seems weird. I gotta add a little bit back here. Can I lower tonnage by shortening the citadel a little bit more? Will this thing scooch forward a little bit without interfering? Oh, it fits right up in here between these two. Oh, I think, no, not quite. Spoke too soon. And that's not really going to do anything. But, will that let me scooch this... Turret for just a bit. Which will shorten the citadel a little bit. Well, the answer is yes, but I did give up some firing arc there to do that. Hmm. About 300 more tons I gotta find here. I guess I could give up, go back down to standard ammo. I don't wanna do that. I thought that would do it. I don't like doing this single bottom though. If I'm gonna, if I'm gonna make the, uh, let's go back up to Carbet Two. 
Okay. Is that enough room to give me enhanced reload back? It wasn't. Okay, going with this. Let's fiddle with the armor a little bit to, for the offset. Oops, no, I went the wrong way there. Through point one. Can I get that done with a funnel? Scooch. Not really. And you're killing me. All right, 0 0.2, I'm gonna live with it. And we got uh, just about 200 tons here. Let's fill it up with, let's see if we can get 13, we can. And that's, that's about it right there. We're eight tons shy. And that's fine. I think the pitch and roll look pretty good for a ship that's got uh, off center line main turrets. Um, I think she looks fantastic. And like I said earlier, this is the. You know, I, in the previous designs, I've said things like, this is an incremental, you know, this is an evolutionary design. It's not that different from... This is starting to get into a revolutionary design, right? When this thing hits the water in 19 months, then the 80-something other battleships and European navies will all be instantly obsolete overnight. Diderot class. Can't wait to welcome you to the French Navy. Save. Okay, the fun bit is over. Designing that thing. Now comes the hard part of affording that thing. <laughs> uh, we do have a hundred million in naval funds. However, yeah, if we look at what the other country, that's not a tremendous abound. I can't afford to run too much of a negative uh, def, you know, a deficit every month. We have a force of sixteen battleships active that is just not tenable with battleships like that these are the smaller you know campaign start battleships most of these well about half of them and that's not just from a monetary perspective i don't i'm not sure i've got the port capacity some of the ports i do but other ports i don't have the port capacity to shoehorn all that extra tonnage in there so some of these battleships are just going to have to go and not on a one for one replacement as they come out of the yards basis, but some of these have to go now and we're going to have a gap. So I'm going to drop the overall battleship force down to 12. 
So four are going to get scrapped right now. And that is two older battleships in La Rochelle and two in Brest. So that is going to be... Yeah, make sure I get the right classes here. Liberté, who I'm not sure ever saw a shot fired in anger. <laughs> Charles Mortel. And these two were our earlier mothball ships, and they've come out of mothballs because we thought we were going to war with Britain, and now they're going to the scrap heap. De Marquette and Revanche. Okay, and that may not be enough. May not be enough. We have, let's look at this again. There are four Normandies and two Sulfurinos remaining. I'm going to keep the uh, four Courons, Courons and the two Duquesnes. So that's six. I need to build six Diderots. Oh my goodness, 6.3 million a month. Build. <laughs> All right. Two of these are going to need to go into La Havre. Two are going to wind up going to Toulon. There's not room at Toulon. Okay. And then also two at Nice. Well, the battleships that are there at Toulon and Nice looks like they're the next ones on the chopping block. And that's going to be the two Sulfurinos. Oh, this pains my heart. Normandy and Bear. Veteran crews, combat veterans. That's hard to do. Still not letting me build them. Should be plenty of room now. Maybe I just needed to exit out and uh, how about now? Nope. Uh, just one? No. Is there a port by port, uh, capacity? Like these ships are big enough that they have to be built only in certain ports? I mean, there's a 23,000, so the combined 
tonnage of two of these is 47,000 tons. Which we do have that capacity in Nice. Why will it not let me select Nice? I don't know. I'll try again after I advance time. Anyway, <clears throat> notice our naval funds did jump up a little bit. I think when you scrap ships, you get a little money back for, well, for the scrap, for the for the metal. So we, we did, we, I'm not going to say make money, but we did recoup a little bit of what had been invested in those older battleships there. And we've got our monthly balance roughly even of course our active fleet we went from 16 our, our battleship force level just got cut in half with our relations with uh, Britain super low although not as bad as they were it's actually increasing a little bit so anyway with the design and construction started of what is almost a dreadnought, uh, I think that's a fine time to bring it into this episode. If you like what we're doing with the channel, if you like this content, then leave a like, leave a comment, maybe even subscribe. If you're new to the channel, this series, and haven't caught some of the other episodes in this campaign, I'm linking the playlist here. But at any rate, thank you very, very much for watching. I appreciate it.